Welcome to the Doctrinal Component with Tom Nettles, brought to you by Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries is a reformed teaching organization committed to the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. For more teaching material by Dr. Nettles, please visit founders.org. Hello, this is Tom Nettles with the second edition of the Doctrinal Component. As I was speaking in our last session, I was explaining something of the source from which we will derive our discussions of these doctrinal issues that arise in a variety of of places and that can help us understand even sometimes uh, what appear to be very minimalistic statements or even off-the-cuff remarks, but nevertheless they have doctrinal assumptions that are behind them. Last time I was speaking about Scripture, I spoke of it as a deposit of revealed truth. I looked upon it as inspired of God, and then as a result of its inspiration, I affirmed its infallibility because it comes from a God in, uh, who never lies, the, the unlying God. Uh, the next characteristic that I want to begin talking in this session uh, is the fact that because it is infallible, this means that there actually is no error in Scripture. If it is impossible for a document to make an error, then that means that there really is no error in it at all. Uh, Every part of it will eventually be seen as absolutely consistent with every other part. Uh, Now, not all of anything can be revealed all at once. It is revealed gradually, and one theme builds upon another. Uh, And uh, the same themes come up time and time again, and there will be things added to them. But in the end, we will see that all of these things are consistent. But because it is giving us truth about a very complex world and it's giving us truth from God who in himself is incomprehensible and his ways with men, we can expect there to be mysteries at times. We can expect there to be uh, difficulties. Uh, Even Paul was hard to understand for uh, the first century Christians. Peter said that Paul writes about these things in his letters in which there are many things hard to understand. But those who do not believe in the absolute consistency of Scripture or the absolute truthfulness of it will take these things, and as Peter said, they will, they will rest them, they will, they will twist them, they will try to make them out to be untrue in some way, and therefore uh, they bring themselves to destruction by making God a liar, by refusing to affirm the inerrancy of his word. Well, because the Bible is revealed, because it is inspired, because it is infallible and because it is inerrant, uh, we therefore understand that we can build doctrine. It is an inerrant presentation of revealed truth, and we feel justified in producing doctrine. Doctrine develops throughout the entire corpus of Scripture. It either gives information that will be used later, or sometimes it receives information that has already been set there, or perhaps Uh, If it is an earlier part of the canon, uh, we realize that these things that where themes first appear, our interpretation of them can be enhanced by what the Scripture says later about these things. For example, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And we go on down and we see that God spoke things into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. So in within the framework of the Genesis 1, we see that the world comes into existence out of the purpose of God and out of the speaking of God, out of the, the absolute rationality of God. It is perfectly consistent with his purpose, and it cannot be anything other than a manifestation in some way of the very Uh, character and the intelligence and the creativity and the beauty of God. Well, we learn this much more specifically later as we look at passages of Scripture, uh, like uh, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. But we also see mysteries within the created order that sometimes frighten us and sometimes are destructive and We look at Romans 8, and we see we have more information about the creation there. The whole creation has been uh, subjected to vanity, and so it is is groaning. It is waiting for the revelations of 
the, of the sons of God, that is, the redemption of our bodies. And so uh, doctrine develops throughout the entire corpus of Scripture and finally comes to a mature development by the end of the Bible where we, for example, creation again, we see a new heaven and a new earth and uh, in which nothing evil will ever reside, as, as Peter says, a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So there is this, this gathering kind of uh, reality that we find within the Scripture. And it is this that will allow us to see a doctrinal component in several places. For example, one of the sources from which we will derive information for this idea of the doctrinal component is Scripture itself. We will seek to highlight the doctrinal implications of, of certain short phrases, of individual words, or of particular events within the Bible, <clears throat> things that might pass by us otherwise without our realizing that there is within the framework of these phrases a doctrine that is assumed and a doctrine that is being built. For example, what theology lies behind James's assertion, if any man does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Well, why is it so important that what we say be something in which we do not stumble? Why is it that if we do not say anything in a stumbling manner, in an erroneous manner, we are perfect people? Well, it's because it is out of the heart that the issues of life come, and these things make their way through the mouth. Paul in Romans 3 talks about the venom of asps being under our lips, that our throats being open graves. And he is quoting from uh, three different psalms, as he has three different phrases that come there in order to indicate that our speaking is something that reflects the tremendous sinfulness that is in us. Uh, Paul, I mean, uh, James admonishes us to be uh, quick to hear and uh, slow to speak and slow to anger because speaking is something that will reveal eventually the erroneous perceptions we have, the envy that is in our heart, <clears throat> the cynicism that we have, and so there is a whole theology of sin uh, that is behind this, this phrase, if any man does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Or perhaps just this phrase uh, out of Luke 5, 3, where Jesus is beginning to teach at the lake of Gennesaret. And he, there are two boats there that are empty, and they're fishermen, and they're Peter and James and John. And it says, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. Now, that seems like a very innocent and perhaps innocuous phrase, but as we go on through that text, we understand that he intended to single out Simon. He took over his boat. Then he took over his profession, showing him that he could bring about a great draft of fishes when he desired to. Then he changed his profession, making him a fisher of men. And then he took over his life because he dropped all to follow Christ. And so just this single event at the beginning of this entire uh, uh, confrontation with or this, this conversation with Peter, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. It shows the electing purpose of God. It shows the sovereignty of God. It shows the knowledge of God. It shows his gracious interaction with sinners in order to bring them to redemption. Well, this is the end of our second aspect of the doctrinal component. Uh, next time I will pick up and I will talk about other sources from which we are going to derive these comments. Again, thank you very much for listening.